The peace of the Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to our worship at Our Redeemer Lutheran Church in Jacksonville, Florida. We welcome those that gather on a refreshingly cool uh, autumn morning here in Jacksonville. Uh, and we also welcome those who join us uh, from many other places through our live stream or through Our Redeemer Lutheran Radio uh, on Live 365. Isn't it exciting, folks here in the sanctuary, to know that uh, people in distant places are able to worship the Lord with us today, too? Well, as we gather together in peace and safety this morning for worship, uh, our minds go to the nation of Israel, which has been uh, viciously attacked by terrorists, first Hamas, a terrorist organization uh, centered in the Gaza Strip, and now I understand also from the north by Hezbollah, uh, already hundreds and hundreds of deaths in Israel and many other people injured. It's a very dangerous time, a difficult time for Israel. They're calling it their 9-11. This is a time for our nation and for all peace-loving nations to rally around the nation of Israel. Now, let me make clear, we do not believe that the modern-day nation of Israel is biblical Israel. It ceased to exist uh, many, many years ago. Uh, now, we believe that as Christians, we are Israel. We are the church. And yet, for many good reasons, we do pray for the nation of Israel uh, and believe that uh, they have a right to exist and to live in peace and safety. They have tried to do that. Uh, with their historic enemies, and their enemies have been unwilling in the case of Hamas and Hezbollah. So it's, uh, it was before any of this happened that I chose the hymns for today, of course, and the first hymn is called When Aimless Violence Takes Those We Love. I had no idea, of course, that it would be applicable uh, in this situation, too. But uh, as we worship this morning, we continue the sermon series, Inspiring Truth for All, and in Philippians uh, chapter 3 from the epistle, we have this wonderful theme verse. For his sake, for Jesus' sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, but that which comes through faith in Christ. And so on the basis of that text, we consider the theme, count it all loss for Christ. We join together in singing our first hymn then. It's number 764, but printed for you in the bulletin. You may remain seated as we sing.
service of morning praise. Good morning. Good morning. The Old Testament reading for the 19th Sunday after Pentecost is from Isaiah chapter 5. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyards. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with, cho with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it. He hewed out the wine vat in it and he looked for it in the yield to yield grapes but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, it did yield wild grapes. And now we'll tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove the hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, or briars or thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain, no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord, the host of the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his, are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold an outcry. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle this reading this morning is from Philippians chapter 3. If anyone else thinks he has a reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of my people of, Jeru of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, the Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, 
a Pharisee as to zeal, a persecutor of the church as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count every as a loss because of the surprising worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ and righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his offering and may share his sufferings, because like him in his death, that by means possible I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already, not that I have already obtained this, or I am already, already perfect, but I press on it to make it my own, because Lord Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what, what lies beyond and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in God and Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Let us rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Gospel for the 19th Sunday after Pentecost is Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through 46. Jesus said, Hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. And the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables. They perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds, because they held him to be a prophet. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, as we sing the sermon hymn it is printed for you one thing's needful i realize that this may be new to many of you but if you listen as susan plays through it the second part in particular uh, i think is very singable
couldn't say amen, and that would be a good sermon all by itself. What a wonderful hymn. You know, I think of the churches that are into all the contemporary music, which tends to be, you know, the short praise type songs that they sing over and over and over again that don't say a great deal. You have a whole bunch of sermons in that one hymn. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. As we continue the sermon series, Inspiring Truth for All, then we consider those wonderful words from Philippians 3, 8 to 11, which I began the service by reading. And we consider the theme, Count it all loss for Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you did not count it a loss to send your son, Lord Jesus, that you did not consider it a loss that you would come and give your life for us. Compared to all that you give to us for time and eternity, yes, we may count other things, all other things but a loss, and especially as we'll see in today's message, all thoughts of salvation by, <coughs> by works or by our good merits or the idea that we have anything that we can give to you. Lord, we would count all those things as lost for the sake of Christ who gave himself wholly for us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, in an article entitled How to Count It All Lost, John Piper, the founder of DesiringGod.org, asks this question. What does it mean? To count everything as loss for the sake of Christ. What does it mean to renounce all that we have for Christ's sake? In our text, St. Paul said, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And then later in verse 17, he says, Brothers, join in imitating me. So this is what Jesus wants of all Christians that we consider everything lost for Jesus' sake. It, uh, in fact, Piper says this is what it means to be a Christian. It's not some advanced discipleship that he's talking about. It's basic Christianity. Confirmed by the words of Jesus in Luke 14, any, of, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Renouncing all we have, you see, is the same thing as counting all things as lost. Counting everything as lost, you see, happens in conversion. When you first become a Christian, you can't be a disciple of Christ without it. Jesus speaks of this conversion in one of his parables. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has to buy that field. Selling all you have with joy to have treasure in the kingdom is a terrible way of saying count it all loss in order to gain Christ. And uh, Piper continues, to become a Christian is to awaken from the blindness of spiritual death and find Jesus so all-sufficient and all-satisfying that we count everything as loss, that we renounce our possessions, and in parable language, we sell all we have to possess the treasure of Christ. Now, it's not that we have to sell all we have, but we need to be willing to do so, to give it all up, if ever called upon to choose. As Piper says, none of us loves Christ this perfectly or lives so consistently, but to be a follower of Jesus, to be a true Christian, means that we will, uh, in one of four ways, be willing to count it all loss. Number one, counting it all loss for Christ means this. We will readily choose Christ if the choice must be made in any situation or crisis. Even though God does not bring us to this crisis of either or very often, nevertheless, it has happened for many Christians that they had to choose Christ 
or they had to choose their possessions or their family or their life. Pope Francis, in one message, pointed to missionaries as good examples of Christians counting, counting it all loss for Christ. He called missionaries the heroes of evangelism. Speaking at a morning mass in Rome on one occasion, the Pope praised Christians who had given up everything to share their faith, and he said this, I'm thinking of them in their last moment on earth, far from their homeland, from their families, and from their loved ones, as they're still saying, what I did was worth it. Com comparing them to the Apostle Paul, he added, I think it is only right that we give thanks to the Lord for their testimony. It's right that we rejoice for having these missionaries who are true witnesses. They were martyrs who offered up their lives for the gospel. These missionaries are our glory, the glory of the church. And of Pope. It's not very often that I agree with the Pope, but I certainly agree with him in this case that the Christian missionaries from history are heroes of the faith. You see, the stories of missionaries and other Christians who have given, a, given a up for Jesus, all for him, inspire us to hold fast to Christ no matter what the world would do to us. Jim Elliott was among a group of U.S. missionaries who felt called to share Christ's teaching with the Waldani tribe in Ecuador in the 1950s. You may have heard his story. Uh, the Waldani people were also called the Al Alka people at the time, and they were one of the most violent known people groups on earth who regularly practiced homicide and fiercely defended their territory from those wishing to exploit the land in the Amazon. Well, Elliot and his fellow missionaries felt called to take the gospel to the Alka people. They initiated contact with the tribe after being taught some of their language, first by dropping down gifts from an airplane, and later by establishing a camp not far from the Wadawni settlement. It was in January 1956, however, that five of those missionaries were killed by members of the tribe as they approached them in person for the first time in the hopes of sharing the gospel. Well, as you can imagine, that story generated worldwide news coverage. And Elliot's wife, Elizabeth, has since written a best-selling book entitled Through Gates of Splendor about her husband's journey. And perhaps the most amazing part of that story uh, is that later on, she and others went back to the Alka people, I think it was two years later, and led many of them to faith in Christ. And it was her husband, Jim Elliott, who said, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Secondly, counting it all loss for the sake of Christ means we will embrace everything helpful and patiently endure everything hurtful, thankful to be closer to Christ. We'll deal with everything in ways that draw us closer to Christ so that we may gain more of him. Well, trained as a shoemaker, William Carey became known as the father of modern missions because of his work in India in the 1700s. He suggested that all Christians had a duty to share the gospel around the world. Uh, and he uh, one time said, young man, sit down. Or rather, he was told, uh, as he was going through this process of looking into mission work, he was told, young man, sit down. When God wants to convert the heathen, he'll do it without your aid or mine. Well, he was not deterred by those unkind comments. And he... Uh, founded later on the Baptist Missionary Society in the year 1792, preaching a message during which he said one of his most famous quotes, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. And it was the next year that he traveled to India with his family, but his struggles continued. 
He saw no conversions for eight years. His son Peter died of dysentery. His wife's mental health failed rapidly. He said, this is indeed the valley of the shadow of death to me. But later he wrote, I rejoice that I am here notwithstanding, and God is here. It was in the year 1800, eight years after he began his work, that he baptized his first convert to Christianity. And for more than 20 years, he served there in India, going on to translate the Bible into dozens of languages of the Indian people and also founding a Christian college to train ministers. He learned that lesson to embrace everything helpful, but to patiently endure everything hurtful, to be closer to Christ and to share him with others. Number three, counting it all as loss for Christ means we hold all things loosely and share things generously for their true value is found in relation to Christ. So we deal with the things of this world in ways that show that we see them as of lesser value, but Jesus of greater value. We seek to live the paradox of 1 Corinthians 7 where it says, let Christians buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. We are in the world, but we're not to be of the world. Born in Aberdeen on the northeast coast of Scotland in the year 1848, Mary Slessor became a missionary to Nigeria under the United Presbyterian Church's Foreign Mission Board. At age 28, she set sail to West Africa, and in August of 1876, she was assigned to the Calabar region where the Efik people lived. It was a community that believed in traditional West African religions and were very resistant to other ideas. And they had a strange superstition about twins. Twins were killed or abandoned at birth because of their superstitions. Well, Slusser saved many, many hundreds of children during her time in Nigeria, even adopting one little girl to be her own daughter. She also traveled to regions of the country that were especially dangerous and where previous male missionaries had been killed. She was known for her pragmatism and her sense of humor. She championed women's rights and she set up a mission hospital for the people whom she served. Well, as you can imagine, serving in uh, deep, dark Africa, she suffered from serious bouts of malaria and other tropical disease diseases, and was forced on more than one occasion to return to Scotland to recover. She died there at age 67, having learned to hold loosely the things of this world and to generously share because of her faith in her Lord Jesus Christ. And number four, counting it all loss for Christ means this. We will not grumble in the smaller losses or grieve for the greater losses, for Jesus is our life, our joy, and our lasting treasure. Gladys Allward was a British evangelical Christian missionary to China in the 20th century. Having been raised in North London in a working class family, she initially worked as a housemaid, but she had harbored for a long time a dream to become a missionary, and she was convinced that her calling was to China. Well, she was rejected by the China Inland Mission Society after failing to pass the necessary tests. But she was given an opportunity later to work for a 73-year-old missionary, Jeannie Lawson, who was looking for a young woman who could carry on the work when she was taken from this world. Well, when Lawson died, Alward ran the mission alone. She went on to serve in the Chinese government as a foot inspector, visiting women all over the country to make sure they were following the new law against foot binding, which was so devastating for many Chinese women. She saw that as a part of her mission work. She also adopted a number of orphans, and she led 100 of 
those orphans to safety during the Jap Japanese occupation. She was called the Virtuous One. She died at age 67 in the year 1970. And her story has been memorialized in film, a wonderful old movie called The Inn of the Sixth Happiness, starring Ingrid Bergman. Why not look it up on YouTube this afternoon or wherever you might find it. It's a great story, a true story. It reminds us of the lesson she learned, not to grumble in the smaller losses or to grieve the greater losses, because Jesus is our life, joy, and lasting treasure. Count it all loss for Christ. We are also called to a life dedicated to Jesus, aren't we? So dedicated that we would be willing to suffer the loss of all things. But we have to ask the question, why? Why would anyone willingly suffer such loss or endure such hardship? Why would these people who went to the mission field be willing to go through all that they did? Why would someone stay with Christ even if it meant former friends were no longer willing to spend time with them? What makes a person willing to, bear, to bid farewell to the world or the life as they knew it? To become a follower of Christ who is warned that they might suffer even martyrdom. St. Paul tells us why in our text from Philippians chapter 3. He begins by describing his own loss. He'd worked hard, sought to obey every commandment of God or every rule of men uh, added by Judaism. He gladly gave it all up, called it trash, rubbish, garbage, excrement, something simply to be thrown away. William Barclay explains it like this. St. Paul's saying, I found the law in all its ways no more use than refuse thrown on the garbage heap to help me get into a right relationship with God. The law just couldn't do it. So I gave up trying to create a goodness of my own. I came to God in humble faith, as Jesus told me to do, and I found that that fellowship I had sought so long. He explains that Paul had discovered that a right relationship with God is not based on law, but on faith in Jesus Christ. It's not achieved by any uh, man, but simply it's given by God. Not one by works, but accepted in trust. And so he says, out of my experience, I tell you that the Jewish way is wrong and futile. So is any other savior self scheme, by the way, any self-help plan to come to God to earn his favor. It's all worthless because you'll never get into a right relationship with God by your own efforts at keeping the law, by being a good boy or girl. You can only get into a right relationship with God by taking Jesus at his word and accepting in faith what God himself offers to you through his son. And so the basic, the basic thought of this passage from Philippians is the uselessness of the law and the sole sufficiency of Jesus Christ and his gospel of grace. In one of his sermons, Dr. Martin Luther, the great reformer of the church, and another great man of God who was willing to give up everything for Christ, told about Anthony of Egypt. Anthony of Egypt is considered to be the father of monasticism. And Luther told how in the third century, Anthony had taught people to withdraw from the world to find God. And, uh, uh, to do so, he spent days at a time on top of a tall pole. Well, in the story, Luther says, God reveals to Anthony that he's not even as good as a certain shoemaker in Alexandria. So all the time he spent on top of that pole and other works of asceticism were worthless. And so Luther says, after finding the shoemaker, Anthony asks him what he does every day. Why uh, the Lord commended him, uh, but not himself. The shoemaker replies, I'm a poor, uh, poor citizen who simply does his job. I pray every day that all people may be saved and that I too, a poor and unworthy sinner, may gain Christ by continuing 
to trust in him. Well, with that story, Martin Luther demonstrated that the lowly shoemaker who knew Christ in the gospel of free forgiveness, salvation by grace alone, was better than the so-called religious expert who taught people that they had to gain God's favor by their works of asceticism. David Starr writes in a September 20, uh, 22 article in the Lutheran Voice, Yes, there's a cost to following Jesus. Yes, you do have to give up everything. You have to give up your self-righteousness. You have to hand over anything and everything that you think might make you worthy in the eyes of God. Fork over your pride in the things you do to bring yourself glory. Give it all away. Give up everything you think might make you worthy of God's grace. Turn over anything you've done to try to earn or deserve it. There's no place for your works in God's plan to save you. But there's more to give. That sin that has become a nice little habit in your life, it's got to go. Let go of it. Leave it at the foot of the cross where Jesus died for it. The guilt over that sin you committed so long ago that has become itself, has built a cozy home in your conscience. Evict that guilt by trusting Jesus' promise. Those thoughts about how God could never, ever love someone like you, put those thoughts out of your mind. And place them in Jesus' nail-marked hands. Being Jesus' disciple means there's no room for any merit of your own in your salvation. Be it being Jesus' disciple means there's no more holding on to sin, guilt, or shame. End of quote. When Jesus says to give up everything and follow him, it's because he's already given up everything for you and me. As Jesus hung there on the cross, he paid the price in full for your sins and mine. Every sin has been covered by his suffering. Every sin has been taken away by his shed blood. When Jesus said, it's finished from the cross, he meant it. Jesus paid the price, you see, to make you his disciple. Even if you could pay all the money and gold in the world, it wouldn't pay for a single sin. Only the innocent blood of Christ shed for you can do that. When Jesus says through St. Paul, count it all loss. He had already given his life for you and me for a lost world of sinners. Because it was later, after his death and resurrection, that the Holy Spirit inspired St. Paul to write those words. And also in Philippians reminded us of the humility of Christ and his willingness to suffer that loss on our behalf. Giving up everything to follow Jesus, you see, is simply recognizing that all your blessings in life are from him. Everything that you have is from him. And so if something is taken away, if something is lost, you can place it in his hands and you can be sure that he will still provide for all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. If your prayer is the same as the shoemaker's prayer in Alexandria, that all people be saved, and that you would be a witness, then you will use those blessings that God does give you in heartfelt service to Christ and his church. Put yourself and everything you have at the disposal of Christ. And if you say, but I'm not as committed to Christ as I should be, or you say with Paul, the good that I would, I do not, and the evil that I would not do, that's what I end up doing. Then remember that Jesus on the cross even rescued you from your lackluster and lukewarm devotion. Yes, he paid for those sins of neglect, too. If anyone sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. It's he who inspired Paul to write and urges you to believe the words of our text and take the bulletin, if you would, be, would join me in reading from uh, verse 
It's uh, the middle of verse 8, for his sake. Or no, verse, it's verses 8 through 11. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Amen. And may the peace of God which surpasses our human understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ our Lord and Savior. And now we join together in singing um, another beautiful song. It's printed in the bulletin for you. It reminds us that we are to be at-home missionaries, witnesses for Christ who are looking for opportunities to share with others uh, all that Christ has given to us. Uh, I'll go where you want me to go, it's called.
receive today's offering. In our prayers this morning, we would include, of course, the nation of Israel and all the allied powers that uh, I'm sure are considering what to do to support that freedom-loving country. We pray that the evil would be quickly turned back, that it would not widen or become involved involving uh, other nations or regions, but we know it's a very volatile and difficult situation, so let's pray earnestly about it. Uh, also prayers for Jimmy Davenport who is back in the hospital. Prayers for Tabitha Davis. Uh, prayers for Alan Taylor as he's having heart and lung issues. Also prayers for Donna Wakefield and for Johnny Harmon uh, who will be having surgery on his eye. Uh, they do not know for sure what it is. Uh, they said it could be a melanoma. It could even be like a freckle. Until they do surgery on the 17th, I think it is, they really don't know. So we want to pray that it's nothing to worry about and something readily uh, dealt with. Um, also, you see the other prayer requests in the bulletin from preceding weeks. Please continue to pray for uh, all those. Uh, and also prayers for safe travel for I and Adrian Beltran, who will be returning from a cruise in Europe. Uh, prayers for safe travel for Linda Mattingly as she's uh, in uh, Europe. Was her sister able to go to this? Okay, so she's there with her sister, also a daughter, Katie, uh, and we uh, are thankful for that opportunity. We also want to say a very special 80th birthday. Uh, happy birthday to Dorothy Head. Today is her birthday, and so happy birthday, Dorothy. We love you, and we thank God for all those years and look forward to more good years uh, uh, serving the Lord with you. Um, there will be a brief elders meeting in the sanctuary at 11.30. Um, also, I wanted to call your attention to the Good Neighbor Day sign-up sheet. It's in the narthex. I've mentioned it last week, and nobody signed up. So please make me feel better today by stopping at the prayer book stand and uh, signing up to help with the Good Neighbor Day. An update on Purpose Christian Academy. We believe that uh, they're going to be starting on Tuesday. Tomorrow, of course, is a holiday. And then I wanted to call your attention to the radio schedule for this week. Um, notice I have a different theme for each week. I encourage you to listen to as many of the programs as possible. And then also on the insert in your bulletin, on the one side you have uh, the uh, devotional writing on your prayer life. Next week I will have uh, the sign-up sheet out for the All Saints Day Supper, a fundraiser for the Care Fund and the musical program that the choirs are going to help with called Singing Saints Christ, uh, Christian Songs Through Life Seasons. Uh, and so mark your calendar in advance, and next Sunday you'll have the opportunity to sign up for that. Uh, at this time, Joe Fisher wants to come forward to say a few words about the budget process. Good morning. Good morning. Let me first say how much I love each and every one of you and how much I appreciated your prayers, 
your cards and your calls during my recent illness with COVID-19. I will tell you I am standing before you today healthy and I feel wonderful. So thank you for those prayers. I wanted to talk to you this morning as the Chairman of the Finance and Budget Committee. Um, as you probably know, we're in the last quarter of the fiscal year. What I don't want to happen is I don't want to wait until December for everyone to turn in their tithing commitments and your budget from each of the committees. What I'm asking is, is that you look at your committee, look at what you've spent for the fiscal year 2023, and determine what it is your ministry will be in the fiscal year 2024. I can tell you that I've had a 2024 budget already put together for us for almost a year now. I can also tell you that Anna is working on a 2024 budget. We will take our budgets with the committee, look at your needs, your commitments, and we will form a solid and a balanced budget for 2024. We have on the table in the narthex a card that says, my commitment to my church. I would like for each of you to take one of these cards and actually I'd like to see it say, my commitment to our ministry. That would be better fitting for what we are really looking for. But if you'll take your card, fill it out, and please have it back to us by the first Sunday of November. That will allow the committee to meet, review, and finalize a budget that we can take to the church council for approval. Once we get their approval, then we will bring it to you. I can tell you committee chairpersons, uh, board chairpersons, if you do not turn in a requested budget, we will decide what your budget will be. And you will have to stick to that budget. We don't wanna do that. We want you to be involved in your ministry, and we want you to make commitments as a committee and as a board and turn it into our committee so that we can give you a solid budget for 2024. And before I finish up, I'd like to say that in our elders meeting this morning, we will be training acolytes. So if you have an interest in becoming an acolyte, Please stay after the service. It won't take very long, and we'd love to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. You know, we are blessed to have a generous congregation, and we appreciate all that you do. We appreciate all that you give in your time, talent, and treasure. One last announcement. We will not be having a third Sunday potluck next Sunday, but since there are five Sundays this month, we'll be having the potluck on Reformation Sunday, October 29th, and after the luncheon that day, those who have not seen it or would like to see it once again are invited to see the movie Luther that uh, appeared in the theater a number of years ago. It's well worth seeing again. Let's rise now as we join together in the Te Deum as printed in your worship folder. We pray you.
Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the church, the vineyard of the Lord's planting, but that by the sacrifice of Christ and the comfort of his spirit, she may yield much fruit for his kingdom. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For confidence to share in the sufferings of Jesus Christ, who died to make us his own, that we may also know the power of his resurrection, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all orphans, that they would be given a safe place in which to grow and thrive, and for generous couples who will give them permanent homes through adoption, so let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our president, our governor, and all elected and appointed leaders, that the light of the Lord may shine upon our nation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For strong hearts to heed the pruning law of the Lord, that we may never presume to sin, nor trust in our own deeds, but look to the rainfall of his grace for our source of life. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For zeal directed, to the gospel, directed by the gospel of Christ, and hands strengthened to accomplish fruitful work of God in this barren world, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For all who commune, that faith may be strengthened and love renewed until at last we feast with all the saints in his everlasting presence, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. Merciful Lord, you sing the song of your love over the vineyard of your church. Lift her united voice through your spirit, that she in turn would freely praise you Praise your lavish grace and proclaim your salvation beyond her walls. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the same Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And Lord, we ask your blessing for those who are ill, those who are hospitalized, including Jimmy Davenport. We ask your blessings for Tabitha, for Alan, for Donna, and for Johnny. Uh, we ask you, Lord, as the great physician, to provide for the needs that each of them has uh, and to assure them of your love and your mighty power. O Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we would also pray, O Lord, for our nation. You have given us this good land as our heritage. Grant that we remember your generosity and constantly do your will. Bless our land with honest industry, truthful education, and an honorable way of life. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil course of action. Grant that we who came from many nations with many different languages may become a united people. Support us in defending liberty and give those to whom we have entrusted the authority of government, government the spirit of wisdom, that there may be justice and peace in our land. When times are prosperous, may our hearts be thankful, and in troubled times do not let our trust in you fail. Almighty God, you alone can establish lasting peace. Forgive our sins, we implore you, and deliver us from the hand of our enemies, that we, being strengthened by your defense, may be preserved from all danger, and glorify you for the restoration of tranquility in our world. We pray for your blessing upon the nation of Israel and all peace-loving nations who would rally to her aid as they've been attacked by terrorism. We ask you, O Lord, that you would uh, bring peace, that you would save lives, that you would restore order, that you would defeat terrorism. We ask this through the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we would also pray, O oh Lord, for your blessing upon the military of these United States. Uh, we ask you to bless the men of the Navy, the Air Force, the Army, the Marines, the Coast Guard, the Space Force, all those that are involved in the defense of our nation, and also who come to the aid of our allies when attacked by evil. We commit to your care in keeping our armed forces and pray that you would strengthen and protect those who serve uh, and support us all. Grant that in all things they may serve with integrity and honor through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Gracious God, you gave your Son into the hands of sinful men who killed him. Forgive us when we reject your failing love and grant us the fullness of your salvation 
through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And we pray together out loud, O Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight. To Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We join together in singing the hymn, O Son of God in Galilee. Uh, please note that we sing it to the more familiar tune of Amazing Grace. <laughs> 